Good. Thank you. So thanks for the organizers for inviting me. And I am fully aware of the fact that my talk, which is going to be half an hour exactly, is um, between you and getting lunch. I know it's been a long session. So I want to um, tell a little bit about the work that we have been doing over the last five years. My lab was part of the um, roadmap project. Um, so if you've been working on this, just a way of an introduction, I'm actually a physician scientist, just like um, the first speaker, so I am a nephrologist, so what I do on a daily basis, I have patients who are on dialysis, uh, we have about half a million patients in the United States, and they spend an excessive amount of time over there, so it's four hours, three times a week, and um, uh, it's not the best to have it. So in general, just a way of introduction to the kidney, the kidney is basically a uh, you know, paired organ, right, at the retroperitoneum, and on a microscopic basis, it consists of, um, I think you can see this. So it consists of the structure which is, called, which is called glomerulus, where you basically filter your blood. Uh, it's actually, you filter a lot, so it's about 100 cc per minute. So you filter about one coffee every two minutes. Uh, and then you, as you probably noted, you don't pee out 10 buckets, actually 18 buckets of uh, water on a, uh, every day. So that's because you have these long and convoluted and different parts of a tubal system, which basically reabsorbs the water and the electrolytes, and then there's some some form of a secretion. So the, the, the function of the kidney is measured by the, the filtering function of this glomerulus. And uh, this is a fibrotic kidney. So in kidney disease that we study and the uh, cause of fancy adrenal disease is basically you get this uh, scarring of the organ where you lose the epithelial cells and then the glomerulus as well. So the function is measured how much you filter and uh, nephrologists are really simple people. So you filter 100 cc per minute. You know, we like that round number 100. Uh, and that's how we measured it. So I know you, many of the people have this notion that, well, why to care about kidney disease? You have dialysis and transplantation. Indeed, we do have it, but I just want to tell you that if you have end-stage kidney disease and you are on dialysis, you have about 20, 25% chance of living through five years, and that's just a little bit better than getting lung cancer or AML, and then it's actually largely worse than many of the common cancers. And uh, just a way of putting renal cell cancer on this uh, bar, on this uh, graph as well. So actually the survivor of renal cell cancer is slightly better than being on dialysis. So it's not a trivial problem. Um, and also it costs about $30 billion a year, which is actually 10% of the Medicare budget, despite these patients actually I think consist only 1% of the uh, of the total population of it, so it's quite costly. You do better if you get a transplant, but very few people are able to get a transplant. So why do people develop kidney disease and how can we solve it? And that's what my lab is trying to understand. So as uh, uh, Nancy Cox kind of introduced this, so it's a complex trait. We have a contribution of genetic contribution. And then we have these numbers for heritability. Uh, and uh, you could see that this is ranges from 0.3 to 0.7. Um, right now, we believe the heritability of GFR among uh, Europeans is somewhere around 0.3. The 0.7 comes in African Americans for end-stage kidney disease, and I'm going to show an example of what could explain that actually very high heritability. And then in a bunch of environmental factors, uh, aging, um, that's why most people um, it contributes very strongly for kidney disease development, diabetes and smoking, and then here you are with kidney disease. Um, so, how to understand the genetics of kidney disease? We have GWAS, and I think people have kind of talked about this quite extensively. This is uh, the data for the most updated uh, GWAS paper from CKDGen that my lab collaborates quite uh, significantly. And there is a new one in the pipeline. This one has about 67,000 participants in it. And the new one is going to have about more than 100,000 uh, cases of European descent. And what you see here, that some of the loci of these uh, come out with high significance. And then uh, we were able uh, to increase the significance. And I actually don't know how many on this part, uh, this um, graph, but right now we have about 67 curated loci that we work on that has shown reproducible association uh, in 
people with European descent uh, in chronic kidney disease development. I will talk a little bit about this top locus over here on chromosome 16. And uh, as you know, I, you know, we all love geneticists. They already gave a name, so we don't have nothing to do with the, you know, after that. They know what the genes that cause kidney disease. Indeed, as it was explained in the very beginning, we really don't know whether these are the actual genes that underlie the association or cause it related to disease development. So as just for many other traits, for kidney disease also, these SNPs are in the non-coding region of the genome, so 80% of are non-coding. And then we have the questions that have been discussed before that how do these SNPs actually lead to kidney disease development? So we would just like to know which one is the causal SNP, which one is the target cell type. Really, because I'm a cell biologist mostly, so we really would like to know the target genes. And then maybe the mode of this regulation would not be as bad as well. So what my lab, um, so this is the framework, the way I, we think about it, and then I think many of the people on the audio thinks about this, of uh, how we could understand and make sense of this GWAS data. So we think that this causal variant somehow localized to the regulatory region in a disease-relevant cell type. I'm going to give data, um, and there are papers from John Stamm and Brad Burstyn also looking at the kidney-associated traits that we believe that actually these cell types somewhere localized in the kidney. It's not really an immune phenotype. Uh, that's what we thought about before as well. So the variant should alter the target gene expression in this disease-relevant cell type via most likely altering transcription factor binding, although we could maybe accept other mechanisms. Um, what we add to this is that we believe that the target expression um, should, the target should be expressed then in the kidney. And then we also think that the target expression should change in disease states. And then we would like to have a correlation how the genotype and the disease state um, changes the target expression. So if we, the, the risk allele is increases the target expression, we hope that we find the same kind of correlation if you look at samples from patients with chronic kidney disease. And obviously, the target expression should somehow cause kidney disease and therefore should be functional. So I will go through a couple of examples. So the first one is that this should be localized in the regulatory region in the kidney. So to understand that, uh, my lab basically uh, started to develop this fairly large kidney bank. So we have more than 1,000 samples at, at the moment. Uh, 1,200 uh, on the last count. And then what we have is um, slightly similar uh, for, for other GWAS data. So this is actually updated uh, with clinical data in real time. So we, mostly these are collected for unaffected part of tumor nephrectomies. Uh, and those patients, uh, uh, the disease, kidney disease incidence is fairly high, 20% of them. And since the common conditions that cause kidney disease is diabetes, hypertension, so these are actually quite highly prevalent conditions in people who are getting nephrectomies who are, you know, the usual 58-year-old, uh, you know, males or humans. Uh, and, but what we have built in now that is this data is, uh, is updates itself. So we have not just the static um, uh, clinical update, but it, it updates uh, over the years as, uh, so we have information for functional decline. Uh, we have done a fairly detailed histopathological examination, which is not just like whether you have a disease or you don't have disease, but we use 20 parameters that are, we hope to use as maybe as endophenotype. So we score different things that people under the microscopes can score of the uh, differentiation of epithelial cells, the scarring, the inflammatory cells, and so on, just by visually looking. So we have a large efforts to do transcriptome analysis, and I think we are about 500 samples that we have done already. And because I told you that there are two different segments in the kidney, one is this glomerulus, which is the filter, and the tubules that kind of process the filtrate. So these, um, we microdissect all samples to glomeruli and tubuli. Um, we have epigenome analysis, mostly methylation, and we are working on... Um, but I will show data to isolate different cell types out of the kidney and uh, make uh, ChIP-seq-based uh, chromatin annotation for them. And then we have genotyped all the samples that we have processed using a uh, biobank chip because it's uh, much cheaper. And then, obviously, we try to integrate all that together to 
figure out what's causing kidney disease. So, so the causal variant should be somewhere in the kidney. Um, so to do that, we get this um, um, kind of organ transplant gate kidneys where we use just the kidney cortex itself or we separate different cell types out of it and using the ENCODE-based chromatin, I mean, chip-seq um, marks, the H3K27 acetylation and K4 monomethylation as an enhancer marks and uh, K4 trimethylations as promoters and K36 trimethylations as, as transcribed regions uh, to annotate uh, regions and different cell types. So now if we look at the SNPs, um, so we could look at in the kidney, this is just a so-called adult kidney, so what you find is what we find and that's fairly similar what's published, is that a large percentage of the SNPs uh, of the 6 to 7 of, of the locus are actually localized to enhancers. So this is actually, there are several ways to do this. This is mapping just the leading SNP that is published uh, in the paper. And then we can kind of enhance this to about 60 5% if you take all the tagging SNPs in the LD block and then you accept that if one of the LD is actually in an enhancer, then you call it as an enhancer, but not more than that uh, for the kidney. And that's, uh, there is a significant enrichment if we compare it to like a H1 stem cell and a fibroblast, this is actually ENCODE data, and then we looked at multiple ENCODE cell types, so indicating that the Kidney disease associated polymorphisms are localized to uh, enhance the region in the kidney. So now we can do a little bit better than that because uh, we have now these multiple cell types that we make out of the kidney and then we made the maps for these cell types as well. And then we can also say that this is actually not just somewhere in the kidney, but maybe in um, some enrichment, although I would take this with a grain of salt, but we see an enrichment that it's somewhere in the tubal epithelium from all the places when we compare it to other cell types that's in the kidney of uh, glomerular epithelial cells, endothelial cells, fibroblasts, and mesangial cells. That seems to be the cell type where, where we see um, kind of more clustering of these uh, CKD-associated polymorphisms. So that's very nice, but that's computational, and then obviously my lab is very interested in the mechanism, so we have to actually uh, do the hard work, so we have to screen through these enhancers and then show that they are actually localized to, and then act as a regulatory region in the kidney. So to do that, we actually use the zebrafish system and this um, very nice reporter system where you have an M cherry uh, flanked by two tall two sites, and then we can do large-scale uh, cloning into it, which we got with Shannon Fisher, who have helped us quite a bit. So we clone all these so-called putative uh, enhancers over here, and then we use a fish where we have, it's a transgenic fish, where we label the tubule. So the zebrafish has actually just one filter by two little tubes on the side, so we label this with green. And therefore, if we clone in the M cherry, we could see that um, whether it's in the you could screen fairly efficiently whether you see that. So here is in the real life, so this is the Q, which is green, and this is the M cherry of, this is actually that chromosome 16 locus, which we are working on dissecting, which had the highest peak on the GWAS, and then we are dissecting into multiple regions, and you see that that actually localizes again to the tubules, so um, the histone-based annotation and now a validation coincides that both of them, this region, somewhere in this region, is able to drive expression to the kidney, so it's a kidney-specific regulatory element. So that's very nice. Um, the question is obviously which, because we are more cell biology-based, what are the target genes of these variants? So this is nice that it's a regulatory region, but you know, what are the target transcripts? And to do that, um, we toyed a little bit with the in vitro transfectional luciferase construct and looking at them, but many of these genes actually, or putative targets, are not expressed in these cell lines that we can easily transfect. So we mostly use looking at um, working through this using EQTLs, which have been introduced before. So basically, you're looking at the genetic variations and the transcript expression. And then, so we have, because we have a lot of kidneys that are genotyped and we have transcript level data, then we can um, use now a kidney specific data to annotate uh, the variants. So, um, 
So it's it, depending on the genotype, you, you see variation in gene expression. So this is a result. So this is 100 of the kidneys that we have because this is of a more homogeneous um, uh, CU descent. Um, uh, we feel that's important. And then you find, you know, large number of so-called e-genes that are genes that have, uh, that are SNPs that are associated with transcript level changes in the kidney. So just to, I probably should have introduced that, that somehow the kidney is left out of all of these big effort, so GTEx is not very good at collecting kidneys. In that big science paper that just came out, they had three kidneys, although I have to say that they made a major conclusion out of that, and I'm not 100% <laughs> sure. And uh, I think kidneys being transplanted, so it's hard to collect them, so I think it's uh, actually a quite useful and unique resource. And also in um, Roadmap, uh, John and Brad Bernstein had some kidney data here and there, but it was really not well represented even in the roadmap data, and it's not part of really ENCODE. So maybe in a way of advertising could be included. Anyhow, so this is a, so I feel that these efforts are actually quite important. So we have number of e genes, which is quite consistent of what GTEx is finding, and then many of them are seem to be called shared genes, about one third of this is shared, uh, what's now published in GTEx. So this is the uh, CCQ3 plot, so with 100 samples we cannot really do trans, so this is the SNP location, this is the transcript location, and each spot is represented here. If that SNP is significantly regulates the target gene expression, and in real life it looks like this. This is, I think, one of the best uh, EQTL plots that we have. So this is this particular variant, which could be CC or CT and CTT. And then you see that this uh, solute carriers, you know, the tubules are mainly, you know, express high number of solute carriers because that's what it functions. It has to reabsorb salt and water. And you see that this variant has a very nice, strong effect on, uh, on the transcript level of um, this particular solute carrier. And then there, this is another one. I show this because this um, being proposed by the CKD Gen Consortium, this um, and, and they did functional studies indicating that this variant actually uh, uh, influences the level of this gene. They did not have EQTL data in the paper. What they did is they did a, a, a morpholino-based knockdown of this gene, and that showed a, a phenotype. But indeed, looking at the EQTL, now this effect is not as great as this one, <laughs> I guarantee you, but there is an association between the genotype of this and the target gene of this, and that seems to validate what is out there. So doing this, obviously, it, you can see very small fraction of overlap with the CKDG was hit, so, and then you what you could do is obviously you can just uh, look at the GWAS SNPs where you can find an association for any type of target gene. So to be very transparent, um, right now I think we have three or four where we have good statistical significance, and then hopefully we will have more, maybe by dissection or um, other methods that we are doing. Um, just in a way of introducing, indeed these eSNPs are enriched uh, and they are more on enhancers, and specifically this is an overlap uh, of, uh, of the tubule cell line H3K4 monomethylation and the eSNP location, and this is the eSNP, these are control SNPs, and you see an enrichment, and that is not there if you use other type of regulatory marks, and then actually this is also not there if you look at other cell types at the kidney, so this is glomerular epithelial cells and mesangial cells. So again, somehow, um, indicating that the tubule epithelial cells may be the important cell type for the kidney and disease development. So I'm going to show you an example of that. So this is that top hit on chromosome 16, and what you see is this is the, uh, the, the, uh, the SNPs that are showing the highest significance, and then these are the genes under here, similarly, that have been shown previously by the other speakers. And... Uh, well, um, you probably saw the first um, uh, plot. Under this is something called UMOD. UMOD has a urinary um, uh, gene, has the name 
urine in it, so it has something to do with the kidney. So that's why this spot is actually was labeled with a big sign UMOD in the kidney, and that's believed to be this SNP is actually seems to increase the expression of this gene uh, by uh, uh, some studies. And but we know that the gene expression actually decreases in disease development. So the SNP should increase the expression of this gene. But in disease, the gene expression goes down. So we looked at this locus again because now we have um, EQTL data. But you see, this is actually quite broader. So there are a couple of other genes around here as well. So this is the locus again. So these are the SNPs here. This is that UMOD. These are the other genes over here. And then here is how the EQTL looks. So this is the uh, transcript expression of the UMOD genes. There is a little trend for increased expression, what has been described in the literature, but it didn't reach statistical significance in our data. Um, then you're looking at the next gene over here, which is actually a gene family, ACSM, something to do with acetyl-CoA medium chain. I really, it's not very well annotated in the literature, but there are five of them, and they are right here together. And this one did not show a change. But this one, if you look at it, there is a very nice uh, change between the genotype and an expression of this gene. And actually, the RPTM values for this gene is fairly decent, um, showing a, 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 as an E gene. This one did not. And this one, again, shows some association. Here is not as nice as for this one. And the expression of this gene is actually much lower. So indicating that for us, when we look at this SNP, uh, which was associated with this gene as a target gene, now maybe one gene away is where we find the significant uh, effect on gene expression. So we included two additional criteria that the target should be expressed in the disease-relevant tissue in the kidney. So this is actually um, a Illumina body map um, RNA-seq data. And then what you see is the expression of these genes of that area in the kidney. What you see is this gene UMOD that's been proposed to be is highly expressed, but our target is also fairly nicely expressed in the kidney. And maybe some expression in the liver, but it's indeed very nicely expressed. And then if you look at the protein expression, indeed, again, it's fairly nicely expressed in the kidney as well. Now, we also added that the target expression should change in kidney disease development. So because we have 1,000 samples, we can actually look at the correlation of the gene and kidney function, because that's a kidney function linear really changes. So going from 100 to 0, you see that there is a quite nice R square and correlation. And then that's not just the RNA expression, but we can pick random samples from the top and the bottom. And then the protein expression correlates with disease development as well. So alteration of the target can cause kidney disease. So the target should be functional in the kidney. So for this, we again use the zebrafish system and the morpholino uh, So as I discussed, the function of the kidney is to get rid of salt and water. If the kidney doesn't function, you don't get rid of salt and water. And that's represented in the fish as having an edema. So they puff up, and then they have a lot of uh, it's pericardial edema. So they have salt and water in excess. And that's what you see if you knock down the the ortholog of this ACSM gene in zebrafish. So in kind of, uh, and that's kind of the proposed function of this ACSM. It's something to do with acetyl CoA and fatty acid metabolism, somewhere not much known in the literature. So in a conclusion, so we have this roadmap to understand GWAS associated hit. Uh, I think human tissue samples, and especially a large number of human tissue samples, are really critical to get to this. Uh, we use the epigenome maps to identify regulatory regions, model algorithms to validate the causal variants, EQTL maps for target gene, uh, uh, target gene identification, and then we look at, in addition to that, we also look at the correlation of the genes with kidney function because we feel that should be also present and then use model organisms. And the zebrafish has, seems to be a fairly quick uh, screening tool to, to figure this out. And then I showed you this out of the three that we have as a hit. But mainly, this is limited by the EQTLs, because right now, this is um, 
these identify, I think, just very few variants with significant effect because our sample size is small and a couple of other issues with that. So that's um, this gene and maybe that has to do something with fatty acid metabolism. Um, I don't know the, how wide with time, but um, I have a few other things that I wanted to share, so I will go through that quickly. So you know that these SNPs actually explain 2% of the uh, heritability, and then we have about 30 to 70%, so what about the others? So these variants, you know, explain very little. So where is the missing heritability? And then there are several things to, uh, to think about this more samples, deeper sequencing, uh, ethnic groups, and epigenetics. I'll show an example for two of these. One is, I think it's absolutely tangential to the meeting, but I think it's a beautiful example of genetics, so I cannot uh, <laughs> skip that. So, um, and that's about different ethnic groups. So the first slide that I show you, GWAS, was Europeans, and then you had these 67 regions, each of them adding together, maybe explaining 2% of heritability. Now, if you do the same admixture study in a black population for kidney disease, you get this one and only beautiful big hit on chromosome 22, one hit, and that turns out to be a variant, a coding region variant in a gene called APOL1, so that's very, very rare for any kind of complex trait, and that turns out to be that there was um, as evolutionary pressure to maintain that coding region variant because that variant protects people from trypanosomiasis, which is the African sleeping sickness. So I guess shows similarities to malaria and sickle cell, right? So this is the same exact story. The heterozygote form of this variant protects you from trypanosome, and then this is the lysis of the trypanosome uh, by this G1 variant, but if you have two copies of this variant, you get kidney disease. And then the odds ratios for kidney diseases is, is not insignificant, go from 2 to 100x. And actually, if you get HIV on top of getting this variant, you have almost like sure to develop disease with these two um, alleles. So just in a way of that, so we, my lab contributed to this by making a mouse model for the variant. And indeed, if we put these variants into specific cell type in the kidney, which is these glomerular epithelia cells, you get disease development. So indicating that indeed this coding region variance is, um, is, uh, is disease causing. So that's one way of finding those rare variants with large effect size going into a different um, population. But um, as part of the roadmap for five years, we were looking at whether epigenetic differences could explain this missing heritability. So um, this is actually just this part of the, uh, my talk is pretty much published. So we looked at samples of 100 microdissected human patient samples, kidney samples with different conditions of kidney disease, and then this is was microdissected, and then we looked at um, changes in these tubular epithelial cells that we microdissected from patient samples of 100 kidneys, and we did genome-wide methylation analysis using um, a method, I would say it's a, some, something like an MRE chip, like a methylation sensitive isoschizomer digestion was developed by John Greeley at Einstein, and of course this Illumina 4 to 50K arrays. And what we find is that indeed you can identify this uh, epigenetic changes in healthy and diseased kidneys that are able to cluster normal and disease samples uh, quite nicely and separately. And if you look at a uh, uh, validation cohort, again, you see that these methylation differences cluster and different in control samples and disease samples. But I just would like to show some of the other things. So we get fantastic p-values, with even with fairly small samples. But what you see is the difference in methylation differences in absolute values is fairly small. So what you see in kidney disease, and I think I see that in multiple other disease conditions, there are changes. They are very consistent changes. We can replicate it in, in different samples, the same changes, but the absolute difference in methylation level is fairly small. Unlike in cancer, when you can see a difference going from zero methylation to 100% methylation, these methylation differences are small. And, of course, the future should tell whether they are actually significant. Going through that route, we looked at 
um, whether these methylation differences um, are randomly distributed to the genome or they are maybe on promoters. There is a lot of data on promoter methylation differences influencing gene expression. Uh, but when we looked at by just RACSIF mapping, these differentially methylated regions were depleted on promoter regions. We could hardly find any methylation difference on a promoter. And when we looked at by chip seq based annotation where they are, they were actually on enhancers, and they were on kidney-specific enhancers when we were able to, um, we looked at the nine ENCODE cell lines again. So these are small differences on enhancers. Therefore, we could look at whether they could potentially influence transcription factor binding. So we looked at the same computational analysis, and we find that they influence several transcription factors. One of them was, for example, 6.2, and then we found a bunch of others. And then I'm, I'm probably very few of them are um, uh, nephrologists probably on the audience, but this is actually a very important kidney development or transcription factor, so as these two others. So it seems that there was some sort of an enrichment on these enhancers that they can computationally bind kidney-specific um, developmental transcription factors over here. Now looking at the other way of whether these differential methylation is actually functional, we looked at gene expression by mapping them to the nearby genes, and indeed we find correlation between differential methylations and transcript level differences, so maybe these differential methylations actually drive gene expression, and if they drive gene expression, maybe they are of course important in disease development, so we had some of, um, like, about 40% of them were correlating with gene expression, and this is going to be my last slide, and they were also, again, uh, enriched for developmental processes. Uh, the same, you find it when you do uh, uh, enhancers uh, for HCK4 monomethylations. Again, they are enriched for developmental processes. So that correlates with some of the data in the literature that kidney disease may be developmentally programmed. This is a slide I borrowed from Francine Einstein from Einstein. So if you feed rats in a control diet and look at the pups versus if you feed rats in a calorie restriction uh, diet, then you look at these pups, what you see is that these pups with a calorie restricted diet develop you know, a one measure of kidney disease, which they leak albumin in there, and that correlates with differences in their epigenome in cytosine methylation level, so indicating that maybe indeed they are programmed somewhere early on. So this second set of conclusion is that we find small but highly consistent cytosine methylation changes in kidney disease tubule samples. They are isolated. The methylation changes are enriched on kidney-specific enhancers, uh, and then they are uh, enriched on fibrosis, and developmental genes are affected more commonly, and maybe that's consistent that somehow this kidney disease has some sort of developmental origin, which is um, being proposed in the literature in the past. And I would like to say that most of the work has been done by a really talented graduate student, Yian Ko. She will be here tom tomorrow, and Hui Gang Yi, who is an um, uh, informatics person in the lab. And the second half of the project is published, and that was part of this roadmap epigenomics project, and we have lots of collaborators who helped us with the, uh, in the GWAS studies or EQT analysis and many of the other work that we have been doing. Thanks so much.